Hey gang, Shelby Platt, and today I talk to you about degassing your homebrew. That's next. <music> So today I thought I would do a specific video about degassing your homebrew. It's a topic I've touched about on a couple videos before. Uh, a while back I touched on it in one of my uh, follow-up videos to how to make simplest way to make booze at home. I talked about in there that if you had too much CO2 left in your brew that you know might affect your gut. Um, a good example of that is if you drink bottled beer and you don't really let the beer open up, if you don't pour it out, you can get a lot of CO2 that causes you to belch, get gas, what have you. Uh, I also referred to it uh, just recently with our homemade uh, hard seltzer, which is what I got here. Uh, at the time, we had a problem of getting a proper hydrometer reading because there's so much CO2 left in the solution that our hydrometer, the buoyancy of our hydrometer was affected and we couldn't get an accurate reading. Um, so I thought today I'd take advantage of that and have another uh, kind of teachable moment and we would talk about degassing just in general. Um, first, what is degassing? Pretty much degassing is, is basically uh, extracting any leftover gases in any form of liquids. Now with homebrew, it's your beer, your wine, your mead, your cider, what have you. We're, we're wanting to get out excess gases which for homebrewing purposes is generally CO2. As most of you out there know, the, the fermentation process, yeast will eat sugar and produce alcohol, but also produces CO2. Now most of the time that CO2 will escape our, through our airlock, and it's generally no problem. But in higher gravity brews, uh, brews with either more sugar or more viscous, um, things like wine, big meads, big beers, that CO2 does not escape as easily in the more viscous liquid than does a lighter liquid. A good example is if you're producing a light beer, blonde ale, pale ale, you know, some kind of simple middle of the road beers, that CO2 can escape no problem. But if you're producing, like I said, a, a, a wine with a specific gravity of 1.10 or 1.13 or what have you, um, this particular hard seltzer was 1.090, a higher gravity brew, more fermentables in there, the, the, the liquid just holds that CO2 more. Um, so real quick, why would we want to degas? What's the purpose of it? Uh, well, first and foremost, uh, especially in the world of winemaking, if you're producing a classic still wine, uh, especially your red varieties, uh, Merlot, Malbec, Cabernet, Zinfandel, whatever, you don't want bubbles. It's not a, it's not a, you know, it is not a sparkling wine. It's a, you know, still wine. So we don't want bubbles for that. Uh, second. The CO2 in here, uh, in your wine, especially if you're making, let's say, a white wine that you want clear, the CO2 kind of prevents it from clearing up. It will kind of hold some of those things, like did yeast seals water in suspension. The, uh, the CO2 just kind of keeps your beer from, or beer, brew, whatever, from uh, clearing out uh, completely. So we want to eliminate that. Uh, next is especially in wine, it increases the sensation of acidity. Your wine comes off being a little more acidic than it actually is. That makes your life a little tougher as the winemaker. You know, you're, you're trying to find a proper balance of acid in your wine, and so if the CO2 is affecting that, it makes your life a little harder, so let's eliminate the CO2. And uh, last but not least, we really don't know how much carbonation or how much CO2 is trapped in that solution. It's something that's not easily uh, detected at the home brewing level. Obviously, you know, at a, at a major winery or brewery or whatever that you know they have the equipment. But that's something uh, a little tougher for the home brewer. So we don't know the level of carbonation. And if we were wanting to bottle condition this or what have you, we don't know where we're starting from. We don't know, you know. And uh, unfortunately, if you're not careful, you could produce, you could overcarbonate, which would lead to bottle bombs. If you've ever had bottles of homebrew explode on you, you know you don't want that. So those are just the reasons why we would uh, degas our uh, brew. Like I said, this is more of an issue with your higher gravity brews, wines, meats, stuff like that, than necessarily your lighter uh, Brew. So it's not something you'll always do. Just know if you're working with a higher gravity uh, uh, fermentals or whatever, degas may be 
an option. Um, younger wines, if you're, if you're wanting to bottle a wine earlier, you'll probably want to degas more than a wine that may sit a little longer or stay you know, in fermentation a little bit longer. Uh, one of the questions I get is when do you degas? Uh, some people believe that you can actually degas through the fermentation process, that every few days you would degas. Uh, I'm not a fan of that because every time you open this fermenter, especially during the fermentation process, you have a chance to potentially uh, contaminate your brew. You want to avoid that as much as possible. So I wait till the after the end of primary fermentation. Uh, I like to degas then, and then you could rack into a secondary fermentation. Some people believe to go ahead and rack into secondary, then degas. That's not as bad. You know, that's kind of a personal choice. But like I said. I'm not a big fan of the degassing during fermentation. Now, um, one of the things that uh, you, people may ask, well, look, if I got CO2 in there that I'm not worried about recarbonating, why can't I just bottle? And conceptually, you can, but again, you don't know how carbonated it is. And also, because of the CO2 in there, you really don't have gravity, a proper gravity reading, so you don't know how thoroughly you ferment it. Maybe right now it has the right amount of CO2, the right amount of carbonation you want, but maybe there's still an active fermentation going on, again, because you don't know from your hydrometer reading, and now you ramp up the carbonation even more, thus you can get the bottle bombs again. So even if you think it's carbonated properly, again, because you can't get a real accurate hydrometer reading, you don't know what that fermentation is going to do. And God forbid you take this with CO2, bottle it, and add a little sugar to it, um, again, that, you, that can lead to uh, some real problems, so uh, we want to avoid that. Now, real quick, how do you degas? Well, there's a few methods. Uh, there's about four and a half methods uh, to degas, so we'll go over those real quick. Uh, first, and probably the easiest way, is time, just additional time. Um, a good example of this is like a mead. Maybe you keep a mead in primary for about a month or so, and then you transfer to secondary and let it sit anywhere from three to six months. Well, over that time, fermentation, active fermentation may be done, but you'll still get bubbles through your airlock, and that is the CO2 eventually releasing out. Now, it'll take time, but in something like mead where you have a long secondary fermentation, that might be all you need to do. Um, again, though, if you're wanting to bottle earlier uh, hard seltzer, we're not going to let age or mellow or anything like that. It's something you'd want to bottle fairly quick. Same thing for younger wines, what have you. So, but anyway, time is an option uh, for you degassing. Like I said, if you have a long secondary, be perfect for that. Uh, next is probably the most popular method, and the one most average home brewers do. And if you're doing one to two gallon batches, it's probably the easiest. And that's simply just stir. You would take again after primary fermentation, you take a spoon or whatever you can get in there, just. Just uh, mix for about two to three minutes. That should be enough to drive off uh, CO2. You might have to do it two or three times, you know, after primary fermentation if it's a, you know, a really big wine or meat or something like that. Uh, but for the most part, about two to three minutes, a couple of times after primary, that should be enough to get uh, that CO2 driven off. Now, another option onto that is if you're doing larger batches, five, 10 gallon batches of wine, they sell attachments to your drill. I'll leave a link down below to one of them. That just, it's a long metal handle and it has a couple of paddles and it'll fit inside your carboy and you just run the drill again for about two to three minutes. And with that drill though, you're able to get a little more agitation, a little, drive off that CO2 a little bit quicker, especially that large size batch. It would take a lot of work for you to manually stir. Let the drill do the work for you. So that's something that's an option too if you go with the stirring method. Uh, the third option is to uh, rack, to rack from primary to secondary and then maybe do two or three of these uh, rackings throughout secondary formation. Uh, that works on a couple different levels. A, when you're transferring from one to the other, that CO2 gets less that uh, uh, released. Also two, you're, you're siphoning off the dead yeast cells in the bottom, so you're continuously kind of clearing it off while you're doing these rackings, and you're also driving off the CO2. Again, though, you would need to do this multiple times, not just one time, to draw off the CO2. And again, each time you're, you're transferring, 
there is a possibility of contamination if you follow sanitation practices it shouldn't be an issue but there's a potential issue and last but not least and the method we're going to try today is actually a vacuum using a, a vacuum um, the example I've got here is let's say this is wine bottle let's say bottle of uh, a Malbec or something like that and we opened it and we had a glass or two but we wanted to keep it we didn't want to reuse it or you know we want to drink it another night or we didn't want to drink the old thing you would take and I've got it attached here on a uh, on an airlock but you take one of these rubber stoppers you would put it in the bottle and then you would take the pump and you would pump the air out you would pump the oxygen that's in the bottle out and then you pull off and reseal and you would take the oxygen out that would help avoid the oxidization it pulls out that oxygen well we could take this setup to pull out the co2 in here and that's what we're going to do i have the stopper attached to an airlock so i'm going to switch the airlock and i'm going to pump that co2 out and that's how we're going to uh degas or hard seltzer so let me uh get a close-up of this so you can see uh the degassing in action all right, let's give her a pump and let's get this. All right, you can see, look at that CO2 getting driven off. We had quite a bit in there. Now, one of the things you're going to want to do is make sure you have plenty of headspace when you do this. God forbid we're up to here, you get a little overflow. But just do this two or three times until you you know you quit getting the bubbles or the bubble size get smaller. Um, the larger bubbles uh, infer CO2. So we'll do this a couple more times and then we'll have ourselves degassed. All right, gang. So we finished uh, degassing our hard seltzer. To be honest with you, there's a ton more CO2 in there than I originally thought. Uh, ended up having to do it a couple of times. If you have to, that's fine. Um, so what I did was I pumped it a little while, let, the, let it bubble up, let it sell back down, release the pressure, did it again. If you're using the vacuum method, especially with a glass carboy, be careful, don't pump it too much. Uh, you'll create pressure in there. We, God forbid you have one of these breaks. Again, it's bad enough with like a 12 ounce bottle, but one of these gallons <laughs> blows on you it would be a disaster. So be careful when using the vacuum method. If you're using the stir method, again, stir three, two or three minutes at a time, give it a little break, stir again, what have you. Uh, real quick, sorry about the noise in the background, I have some new house guests, and I'll just leave it at that. Uh, anyway, so we are degassed here. Um, my next step with this is to go ahead and we're going to, uh, like I said in the preview, in the uh, hard seltzer for you. We are going to actually bottle condition in this mini keg. I'll go over with you how to disassemble, clean, and then uh, methods on uh, priming uh, for carbonation. Well, I hope you liked this video. If you did, please subscribe down below. Also, please like the video because it lets YouTube know we're putting out good content. If you need questions, comments, concerns, you can always leave them in the comment section or you can contact me on the Twitter page. Till next time, bottoms up.